the way I describe it is still a little rough around the edges because if you look at it in the first section you, I'd say in the Kaicho news particularly uh, much was made about the transparency mm -hmm. so in the first few sections it sets out a couple of principles and one of the principles being transparency but then as you go through it the minister has still has because we, we made these comments as the Chamber of Commerce early on that the, the minister was featuring very prominently only in the policy yeah because you have a lot of pieces saying the minister shall the minister shall for instance on the release of the information on the local content plans so you know you set out at the the initial pieces of it transparency but then release of the plans and information is the minister shall so you know that leads me to give a kind of i mean that and other pieces of analysis in it lead me to say that it has some good details in terms of what, how to prepare the local content plans, mm -hmm. what should be included in the plans, but in the overarching, it still needs some work to improve it, I, I'd say, before I would consider it final, final. I mean, I know the, ministry, the Department of Energy put it out as final. But so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Kaitra News has been reporting a lot about these confidentiality provisions in this policy. Um, we would prefer that the public has a chance to adequately scrutinize how much oil companies and their contractors are giving to the country and not just have the minister be the one to scrutinize and say, oh, they're doing a good job. What are your thoughts on these confidentiality provisions being built into this policy? Right. So, so what's going on is the way I describe it is that the policy leaves discretion in the hands of the minister. And I l let me paint a picture for you. So let's first start with the fact that the policy describes the minister. Mm -hmm. Now, who is the minister? Because going back to it, the policy says at the outset, this policy is kind of an orphan. The policy is not linked to national development planning. Mm -hmm. The policy is not linked to the overarching uh, regulation for the sector. Yeah. So the policy exists here as this orphan, you know, and the minister shall be fully in control of implementing some of these things, right? Who's the minister? If I, uh, if I were to turn around and ask you a question and say, who is the minister? Who would you answer? I would have said Minister Trotman, the Minister of Natural Resources, but then it's also hazy there because the Department of Energy was moved out from under his ministry and is now under the Ministry of the Presidency. Exactly. Yeah. And, and for the public, because I, I think what we should do is paint a picture for your readers because you're mm -hmm. doing a lot of reporting, you have a lot of information. I, as a business association, have a lot of information, but we should paint the picture for your listeners. Mm -hmm. So for your listeners, you have a PSA contract signed between the government of Guyana and ExxonMobil, right? Yes. And particularly GGMC. When you look at the, the petroleum legislation, it'll feature government of Guyana and GGMC, right? Right. And it's expected that the subject minister of GGMC will be the sub sub subject minister for any policy, right? Mm -hmm. But then you have a carve out of all petroleum activities uh, under the Department of Energy, which is under the Ministry of the Presidency. So, you know, that is why the question is, who is particularly responsible? Now, the Department of Energy has put out this policy, but who is the minister that's going to implement it? So right from the get-go, there are a few issues. I mean, I will say that w what the policy has done well is the detail in terms of reporting on the local content plans but from the get-go, the overarching strategy, I think it needs to be strengthened. Okay. Because if I were to go back over some of the, the Chamber of Commerce's recommendations, and we, we put out a, a policy paper that is accessible on our website, we had said that you have to have a local content policy being part of a national development plan. Because what's going to happen is you have this new industry and very few Guyanese firms are going to be competitive in the industry because they lack experience, they lack the international certification. So you have to have a national development plan that says, well, overall, the, the economy of Guyana, we want it to look like this. Maybe we want 
so much of the GDP coming from petroleum, the, from the petroleum sector. And then outside of, well, sorry, what I should say is within that, we want so much of it coming from actual funds from lifting crude oil, but then we want so much of it coming from people doing work in the industry. Yeah. Now, when you set that out, you can then start to build in policies because we have to train and certify people. Otherwise, if we do not train and certify people, what we have is a lot of words here that look good, but don't mean anything. And I mean, when I say train and certify, you have to upgrade institutions like our technical and vocational institutions, as well as the University of Guyana. So going back to it, at the outset, if you're going to say that this policy is divorced from national planning, it's like, okay, great. So you have the policy, but how do we actually implement it then? Okay. Now, I want to bring you back to my question about confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that any of that is necessary in a local content policy? Because no, no. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I could say that straight off the bat. I mean, when we did our local content policy forum, the key thing that came out and what we create, what we looked at were a certain set of principles that you build a policy on. And, and they, they espouse it here. They said that transparency is, is a principle it should be built on. Right. So for us, we feel, yes, transparency is something it should be built on. How do you, how do you show a policy or, or espouse transpar transparency in a policy? You have to have reportable information that is fed into an institution like parliament. I mean, the key issue here is that government of Guyana and this is government as an institution, not government as a political party, doesn't seem to have the trust of the Guyanese population. And I mean, it's a sad reality because when you read a lot of the reporting, the key issue, if you try to look across a lot of the headlines, what is the key issue in the headlines? Lack of trust in government as an institution. So mm -hmm. therefore, how do you get around that lack of trust of, of government as an institution? Transparency. You need to have this information available and, you know, I mean, wor the world is trending towards open data. Okay. And you'd say that there is nothing that you can think of in terms of local content that would require confidentiality, justifiably. Well, I'll put it this way. If you claim that, you see, l let's look at the structure of, of procurement for the, 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 the works going off offshore you're going to have the operator and then prime contractors and then under the prime contractors subcontractors and subcontractors mm -hmm. you can argue that maybe the details of a particular contract could be confidential if it has technology in it so if if as part of executing this contract there's a particular technology but what we're talking about is that it, so in this policy, let's, let's, let me start with something good. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it has that the, sub the, so the prime contractors have to have a sub-local content plan. I don't think that that has to be hidden. We should understand what is this, the, the, the prime contractors' sub-local content plan. Right. Be and then, so the, the policy says that you, you know, the operator will present a plan, and then that plan will be built up of things the operator does plus things the prime contractors do with their sub plans and that feeds back in i don't see why any of that information has to be confidential while i respect things like particular technology around maybe pipe coatings or, or stuff being commercially sensitive that's fine but that still doesn't speak to well we employ so much guyanese workers we have spent so much procuring these goods and services in guyana these are the anticipated tenders that we have coming up in Guyana. That, that doesn't need to be hidden. Okay. Now, the GCCI made a series of recommendations in a paper. Mm -hmm. How many of those recommendations would you say were uh, included in the policy? I would probably put it at somewhere around. I mean, so, so I've, I've been able to go through the policy once or twice, but I would say somewhere around maybe... 50, 60 percent. Not, not, there were a few things. For instance, I can point immediately what was not included. So we had looked at a particular set of tests to say what a local company would be. And you see in the definition of a local com uh, company in this policy, 
you know, there are some things that we feel based on our forum that are lacking from that definition. Because you know, in Guyana, we have a particularly interesting set of international arrangements. Right? Yeah. So for instance, you know, a CARICOM registered company could come in, register a local subsidiary, and by our tax laws, that local subsidiary is a Guyanese company. For all intents and purposes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and you run the risk, I would say, with this definition, that if you had a CARICOM company, just basically ask a Guyanese shareholder, this, a Guyanese person to be a shareholder, and just pay them a nominal fee, but repatriate most of the profits, they would still pass the test here of being a local company. And that's okay. a risk. Now, the policy, it defines um, local companies. Uh, it also talks about um, a CARICOM, CARICOM companies. Could you talk a little bit about how it classifies companies and how it classifies um, nationals of Guyana, non-nationals, or a CARICOM national? Well, what the policy does is it sets out, uh, let's say, locals, CARICOM, and rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And they define, I think, a local company is a company that's 51% majority owned by a Guyanese. Which is what the chamber suggested. Right. But we had, so we had about five tests of a local company. Yeah. 51% uh, ownership. We had board meetings held in Guyana. Majority of employees, Guyanese. And I think there were about two other pieces that I can't recall right off the top of my head. But, you know, so let, let's look at what the policy says. And the policy says, Guyanese owned registered in Guyana. Uh, means existing or potential supplier that has 51% or greater of his share capital partnership share owned by Guyanese citizens and is registered in Guyana with the Guyana, Guyana Revenue Authority. And where the offices, et cetera, et cetera, are located in Guyana. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me give you an example. Let's say, mm, and let's, uh, before that, let me talk about CARICOM owned here in the policy. And I guess this is page 10, right? Yeah. So CARICOM owned, registered in Guyana, uh, is refer it means an existing or potential supplier or subcontractor company that has 51% or greater sh of its share owned by citizens of a CARICOM country that is not Guyana, registered in Guyana with the Guyana tax authorities. Okay, so what's the difference between the two? If I have a major CARICOM conglomerate yeah. open up a facility here and just hire a local to be a shareholder. And what I mean, because the accountants are probably balking at me, saying, what does he mean hire somebody to be a shareholder? Somebody has to invest to be a shareholder. Yeah. Well, if I say that, okay, I'm gonna, I need you to be a 51% shareholder here, but we're going to have a subsequent agreement, right? That I charge so much for my services. So what I'm doing is adjusting the profits in that company through a secondary arrangement, right? So that even though you're a shareholder, you're actually just there for me to pass the local content test. Right. So how does this policy with these definitions prevent that? It can't, not with these definitions. Okay. Now, could you say a little about the other recommendations that GCCI would have made that may not have been included? So let me pull these up for you because the thing is, is that we went through a number, a number of recommendations. And in fact, I had a presentation I did really recently for the Trinidad Energy Chamber. Right. I, I think um, the chamber had made a local content legislation piece that you yep. proposed. Yep, yep, yep. And so going back to, to that, we had said that, you know, a local company should be one where its board meetings are held in Guyana. The mm -hmm. company's head office is located in Guyana. A certain percentage of the workforce is Guyanese. And then we came to the company should be registered in Guyana with a Guyanese owner 51% or more. You know, and going back to the outset, we had said two things I have not seen here, which is that the local content policy must be part of a whole, meaning that it has to go along with 
the overarching regulation for the sector. Yeah. It has to go along with the national development plan. One additional piece I didn't see is that, yes, the policy says that it is a precursor, but we would like to see a specific timeline to legislation. Because one of the questions I've been asked is, should we go with legislation or just a policy? And then one of the questions I had to answer internally was that if a contractual dispute comes up as a result of this policy, so you're a Guyanese company A, mm -hmm. you've bid for, uh, to provide a good or service, and you feel slighted that you were capable, both technically and your commercial terms were you know, fair, and then you still don't win the ability to provide that good or service. Now you want to go to have some sort of a dispute res resolution mechanism um, activated. What dispute resolution mechanism do you have that you can really trust in? Mm -hmm. Ideally, you'd want to go to arbitration or court, but to go to court on a policy is a little hard. Right. Okay. Now, you went to the Trinidad and Tobago Energy Conference mm -hmm. earlier this month, and there you told um, the gathering about what the GCCI proposed as a test of a local company, and you got a lot of resistance. I remember there <laughs> being a World Bank official there. No, no, no. Let's, let's clarify. <laughs> it was the, the Shell representative. She had previously worked for the, the, the World Bank and so mm -hmm. she'd had some of the information she had garnered was not just information from Shell but information from her time at the World Bank. Mm -hmm. So she said that essentially the proposition that the, that the chamber made as a test of a local company would be in contravention of WTO, World Trade Organization rules. And you also got a lot of uh, opposition from some Trinidadians. And uh, tell us about that. But, so let me, let me set that up. So the first thing is that I've heard that before. And I think the defense that was told to me then, because even I'm no expert in it, but the defense that was told to me was that the WTO <coughs> makes provision for developing countries. Mm -hmm. So the developing countries have a little bit of a leeway in terms of crafting some protectionist policies because the, there's an understanding that the developing countries have weaknesses in their economy that they need to strengthen. Yeah. So it's not a, a one-size-fits-all for the WTO across developed countries and developing countries. They have given some measures to allow for some am amount of protection by developing countries. So that's, that's the first piece. Now, the other piece is that I, it, it, in the Trinidadian Energy Conference, and I, I guess I would say is it was an important step in breaking the ice for the Trinidadian uh, Tobago Energy Chamber to invite me there. And I know that they had gotten some flack of, about the way they had approached the market before. So it was nice to see kind of breaking the ice and working to see how we can build a relationship. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you know, I met with two types of Trinidadians. Those who felt positive and understood where the Guyanese were coming from. Uh, and these were the guys who, because uh, I think I made an immigration joke somewhere in my, my response. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, these are the guys who were saying, well, you see, for years you treated the Guyanese this way. And low, low. But the, the thing is, is that the Trinidadians who saw what was happening to them, because even with them who have advanced companies in the oil sector, they're still having questions on local content. And the yeah. Trinidad Energy Chamber president told me that they were implementing a set of new measures to measure local content as, as, as a result. Yeah. You know, I mean, when Guyana threw this stone into the, the water, the, the ripples really went far. You know, it, the ripples didn't just stop at Guyana's borders. And coming back to it now, the ones that you really want to talk about, the companies who opposed it, to me, I feel those companies look at our market, want to make investments in our market, but don't see themselves as needing to partner with Guyanese. 
and that is the ones who are trying to raise a red herring and to be fair to the trend audience we can't paint them with with a single brush you've got some who i think have some positives and want to partner with Guyanese, but then the ones who are in opposition to that particular comment of 51 percent um Guyanese own they want to come into the market and they want to invest and they may not be so enthusiastic about partnering with Guyanese. Do you know that the international community or the international community that is affiliated with these oil companies has opposed local content advocacy in other countries that have it, like um, certain African countries, for example, that our policy was based on? Have Well, so that's, a, that's an interesting one. The way I would say it is that we were able to meet with the chairman of the Public Accountability Committee in Ghana. And what he said is that, look, you know, we, we value Exxon as an operator. That's great. And mm. it, for him, it, you know, it's, it's not Exxon, it's Tolo particularly, because Exxon, I think, is still doing some exploration activities yes. here. But he said, you have to build your own capacity and oversight your own regulatory capacity and oversight. I mean, it's nice that they come in with, like Exxon had its own internal definition of local content, but this, this is our resource mm-hmm. and this is our country. Yeah. We have to set the, the, what we think. Uh, we can definitely take input from them, but we can't have them write it for us. We have to do this ourselves. We have to grow up as a nation. Okay. We're going to go on our first break, and we'll come back in a few minutes. And when we do, I want us to talk a bit about um, stability of employment in the oil sector. Because, you know, I came across a few articles recently. One about ExxonMobil having to cut down on employee travel because, uh, you know, and then there was another article about Tolo having to cut down on about a third of its staff because they've been having troubles. So what I wanted to get into is how uh, much can Guyanese depend on their involvement in the sector being stable? So when we come back. Election offenses are actions and practices that are forbidden or prohibited by law for purposes of achieving free and fair elections. Certain actions committed before, during or after the elections could be deemed as election offenses. Some election offenses are registering or voting more than once in the same election, voting or attempting to vote if you're not qualified to do so, voting in the name of another person, living, dead, fictitious, or not qualified to vote, canvassing for voters or molesting or interfering with an election within 200 Hundred yards of a polling station, compelling a person to vote in a particular way, attempting to vote before the poll is officially open or after it is officially closed, removing or defacing a lawfully displayed official electoral notice or election campaign poster, offering false information for purposes of being nominated as a candidate, printing or being in possession of a ballot paper or other election material without lawful authority, having unauthorized possession of a ballot box or tampering with the contents of a ballot. Deliberately obstructing or interfering with the work of an election officer. Assisting a political party or candidate to gain an unfair advantage over others. Giving or accepting a bribe for purpose of voting or refraining from voting. Inciting enmity or hatred against a candidate or party on the grounds of religion, ethnicity, profession, gender, sexual orientation or political affiliation. Organizing or training persons in the use of force or violence to commit a breach of the peace. Your ballot is secret. Do not take pictures after you have voted. An elector, a candidate, an election official or security personnel can be prosecuted for committing election offenses. A person found guilty of an election offense may go to prison or pay a fine or both. For some offenses, a person may also be disqualified for some time from voting in subsequent elections. Do not commit election offenses. A message from the Guyana Elections Commission. We're 
We're back with Petroleum 101. I am your host, Kimal King, and we are joined here to talk about Ghana's final iteration of the local content policy. Well, it's not final because it will get some adjustment every now and then, but this is what we're working with. And so we're discussing this policy with the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Nicholas Boyer. So before we went on break a minute ago, I mentioned a few recent stories um, in international media about oil companies having to cut down on spending and essentially just laying off a lot of staff because of uh, issues that come with the industry. Sometimes they drill a well and it's not as successful as they want it and so they have to reorganize themselves and this in turn affects their spending. What are they going to spend on services? What are they going to spend on goods? And how does that affect people who want to participate and to get value for themselves from the industry? Um, what can you say about that? Well, that, so yeah, that's definitely a mouthful. So let's look at it in terms of two groups. So the first group mm -hmm. is the operators who are still in exploratory activities and the local content uh, uh, policy right now is light on them because it recognizes the transient nature of exploratory activities. Um, one thing I should commend it for is that what it does do is it, it kind of puts a nice little fence around the operator who is doing both development and production mm -hmm. as well as exploration. Yeah. So in terms of our ecosystem right now, you have Exxon who is still doing exploration while doing production and development. So they're producing from Lisa 1 while still doing some development drilling for Lisa 1. And they're doing, well, they're going to be doing development for Lisa 2. So you have that as compared to a Tullow who had just done some exploration wells. So the policy s does not make huge demands of Tullow because they understand the risks of the exploration activity. Yeah. But your question is particularly, and, and as we kind of discussed through the break, you know, what you wanted to bring out, we want, what you wanted me to bring out, was kind of whether Guyanese can be dependent on employment within this sector right. over a long course. Now, one of the first things is that this sector is subject to a lot of boom and a lot of busts. Right. Because it is, you know, commodity based pricing. For instance, I think the, the coronavirus alone wiped out about twenty dollars US in the, the price per barrel of oil. Yeah. Right. So for us as Guyanese, the policy says and so we have three point two point seven point one. A lot of points there. And it says, in association with each project and related work activities described in the early local content plan, the operator shall provide a list of job positions anticipated to be required by the operator and primary contractors and provide yearly estimates of the utilization of Guyanese labor as follows. And it says, a list of job, craft, roles, expertise by wor work activity, and how these map onto the following job positions defined in this policy. Senior management, professional, supervisory, middle management, skilled, semi-skilled, basic skill. Okay, great. So, you know, and this is the thing about the policy. It starts out with a lot of great principles. It has these details, but one of the key things is the, the actual operationalization of these details. Yeah. Because in this policy, it's essentially going to say, Operator, you submit annually this local content plan. And annually, we want you to talk about all of these fo these positions, some of which I would expect like full-time senior management to be full-time, right? Yeah. Uh, you could expect like basic skill and semi-skill to be part-time. So you're going to submit to the, <coughs> this list to me annually. Okay, great. Well, what's the point of the list? Because you need to have some sort of mechanism building in. Well, we would like to see, you know, a natural development or some sort, well, one should say natural development, but we would like to see a development of this workforce to become more and more Guyanese over a certain period. Right. And we, as the government of Guyana, going back to it, are, will invest in the educational uh, institutions to ensure that uh, 
the, the percentage of Guyanese workers keeps increasing in industry. Let me say this because I know a lot of people who criticize our advocacy on local content say, well, you know, because of the booms and busts, you cannot have the whole country work in the petroleum industry. I am not saying that the whole co- country should work in the petroleum industry. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that I expect the population of Guyana to grow. You know, I, you can see a lot of the diaspora interested in moving. You can see us importing a lot of skilled labor in. So you expect the population to grow. What's going to happen is as the population grows, the percentage of the total workforce working in, in, in petroleum should still be relatively balanced as long as we have a national plan that pushes the growth in the other sectors. Because what a lot of people talk about is avoiding the Dutch disease, meaning avoiding a sector like petroleum overheating so much where you have such high wages that's pulling every, everybody wants to stop farming suddenly and go to work in the oil industry. Well, going back to it, at the outset, the plan says it's orphaned away from national planning. Yeah. So that's a risk. W- what you're asking me, in essence, is is there a risk there you know, that the people employed in industry would be subject to booms and busts. Yes, because unless you have a national development plan that says, yes, we want Guyanese to work in the industry, we want to increase the percentage of the workforce that's Guyanese, but overall, we also want to continue the growth of our other industries. We want to continue the growth in mining. We want to continue the growth in agriculture so that you don't have just one runaway sector overheating and most of the employment coming out of that sector. Going back specifically, why you do want Guyanese employment in the industry is because it costs a lot to have an expat, expatriate worker in country. You know, most often you have an expatriate worker and their family moving into the country. You have to pay housing. You have to pay transportation more than likely it will not be two workers in the household. It'll be one worker. So, you know, and and you're going to be paying, you know, that that expatriate is coming with a certain expectations in terms of quality of life. And you're going to have to pay to to give him that, to match those expectations. So you can imagine it's cheaper for us to use Guyanese labor. The only thing is we need Guyanese labor that is up to standard, understands the health, safety, security, and environmental regulations within the industry. So we got to train them. We can't just toss Guyanese labor into it just like that. We have to train them. <coughs> okay. Now, you had said that production without a policy, as we had started in December, is, was a failure on Guyana's part. Mm-hmm. <coughs> what can you tell me about how members of the chamber have, in this period, managed to penetrate the sector right so what I would say is let, let's look at it I said forest oil without this policy in place is a failure mm-hmm. you know somebody could st- could let's say be on the converse and say well you know why look you have the policy now forest oil was only in December well let's look at it from procurement Lisa one which was several billion dollars I think just sh- Three point seven billion dollars has already been spent. Lisa one is sitting. You know, the 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 Lisa destiny mm-hmm. is sitting off of our coast right now. Right. The Lisa unity, the hull is already in sailing. Right. And some of the procurement activities has already gone. So if you're in the the maintenance phase, so what, what they call in the industry. The brownfield phase, okay, fine. You can still get into the procurement for Lisa 1 because it's now what opportunities you have for the operational aspect. But if you wanted to provide some services in the construction phase, yeah, that, that ship literally has sailed, uh, literally. So for, for us as Guyanese, you know, what we're talking about is that unless we have this policy, a national plan, and then the I- commensurate investments behind it, then you know we're going to be at risk of just trying to keep up. It, it, we're literally being tossed in the, the ocean to learn how to swim, mm-hmm. right, without a life jacket. 
I mean, to be fair to the operator, the <laughs> operator has started the Center for Local Business Development and they have done a certain amount. But what have we done uh, f from our end as, as what sort of policies and regulations we have put in? And we put this policy in, so we're two projects late. And the policy still has some pieces that it needs behind it because the policy sets out something. We still not need now the investments behind the policy to right. get that movement, to get that action. Because you have now a number of fledgling Guyanese companies or startups who are aiming to provide services in the industry. And I see them every day at the chamber. And a lot of these guys are going to be successful. But they're facing headwinds in access to finance. They're facing headwinds in, being in getting certification. And they're facing headwinds in terms of, of having regulation that helps them, you know, because maybe I'll, I'll say something weird here is that I believe we, are, we, we need policy and protection for a short period of time, well, short being maybe five, seven, eight years, because I believe that our Guyanese entrepreneurs are going to become at least regionally, if not internationally competitive. Maybe I'm... I'm be foolish, but you know that's that's the way I see it. But we need regulation to help protect us while we grow. It's the same way a parent would nurture, you know, a, a child that's now growing up until that child is able to, to fend for itself. So you can imagine coming from a, an ecosystem where we've never played with these high level of standards and certifications mm -hmm. you need some time to build up but then you can have regional companies swing in that have been doing this for the last 10 20 30 years and say here it goes here's all our certifications a through z but if we only use the regional firms how are we going to build the local firms now let me see if i got you right <coughs> in terms of the construction phase for the first two projects lisa one and lisa two the ship has sealed and locals have to su a very large extent not been able to um, get in. Well, the way I'd say it is that phase is gone mm -hmm. and whatever procurement they did locally, that's it. Okay. That's as much procurement as has been done locally. And I mean, I don't have the figures, which is going back to why we, we believe transparency should be as good as it's a principle, but it needs to be executed, mm -hmm. not just kind of be a, a high level principle. Uh, we need to be able to see what the, the local content numbers were on Lisa 2. Um, just for full disclosure, right? my firm, so the startup I have in the industry, Guyana Oil and Gas Sports Services, yeah. we participated in some amount of work for Lisa 2. And I mean, it, <laughs> it, I'll put it this way. There's some amount more that we could have done and, and we would like to be able to do. But, and we are making the investments to do as we grow in capacity. So it's a natural process, but we need to be exposed and we need some amount of help from, from the government. They, they have to provide that, that environment that fosters our development. Have you surveyed the members of the chamber about how much they've been able to penetrate the sector? Can you give me some statistics? Oof. That I I would say we would we are guilty of not doing. Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely something we should do, which is survey to see how much members. Uh, I think the I do have a certain report from our membership that says how many members classify themselves as being the oil and gas sector, mm -hmm. and and uh, that is one of the large fastest growing sectors in the, in the chamber. But I don't know how much offhand or have not surveyed how much have actually done business with Exxon. I think yeah. that I, I, someone had asked me that maybe a year ago and I I'm, I'm, but have failed to deliver on that. So that's something I need to fix. Uh, you know, the thing is, some of these companies are members of the chamber. Are you involved in getting reporting from them on how much they're giving to locals? So we've definitely gotten some information uh, so, for instance, Exxon had done an update presentation recently um, at the Center for Local Business Development for mm -hmm. the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry members. 
and in the presentation they were they they did present some information but i'll be honest i saw a lot of detailed information presented at the trinidad and, and tobago energy chamber by the exxon rep then right. so i think that they they have data they can present and we would like to see more of that data okay okay <coughs> and in terms of getting the members of the chamber um to comply with the the standards and the requirements that they need to participate in the sector how has the chamber been doing so, uh, so and and here's something i mean i, I want to disclose this as well so we my startup has been selected by the, the center of local business development to be part of iso mentoring right so yeah. that that aside the chamber has a direct relationship with the Bureau of Standards Organization. Mm -hmm. And we have shown and given members a lot of information because members who are not going through the center for ISO mentorship can go to the Bureau of Standards. So for the chamber's part, we have been providing information on how people can get certified. In addition to that, we have designed programs. So for instance, with agro processing because remember we're bigger than just the our advocacy is bigger than just the oil and gas sector mm -hmm. we're going to be executing a program with cdb to push and promote standards and certification now to answer your question my members have been very receptive to this and they recognize that they need to implement standards in their organization and are doing that day by day so i'm, I'm quite proud of them Okay. So I, I, I see in them the fight to become better and better, which is why, you know, going back to it, if we rely on only the regional firms to do this work from us, we won't push these guys to grow outside of their comfort zone. Okay. Um, I want to end this conversation on a, a wider topic. Mm -hmm. um, you might have read... In, on the front page of the Kaitra News today, a very detailed, um, I'd say, impassioned front page comment. It is about a history that Guyana has of foreign firms coming to our shores and benefiting from very generous terms. And the result is often that a lot of, of Guyana's wealth gets to leave with foreign firms and there's a question of how much locals get to benefit from that so when we come back from the break i'd like you to touch a bit on that sure let's go is getting fit and staying healthy your new year resolution if your answer is yes let digicel help you make that a reality Join us daily, 5 to 6 p.m. for Mass Fit Fitness Program at the GCC Ground Border starting from January 13. Come have fun with our fitness guru, Vanilla. She will help you tone up and shred those unwanted pounds gained over the holiday season. Be healthy, be fit, be sexy, and most of all, be ready for Mass 2020 with Digicel. Kaicher Radio, keeping you informed. Demerara, Anessa Quibo, 99.1 FM. Burbies, 99.5 FM. Kaicher Radio. Radio. back with Petroleum 101. I am your host, Kimal King, and we're talking about Guyana's final local content policy. Joining us tonight is the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Nicholas Boyer. Now, we've had our conversation about local content. Now we're going to have a wider discussion about how Guyana relates to international firms. Um, we've had a lot of issues with companies like Bosai, um, Baishan Lin, Ga Guyana Goldfields, and so on. And now there is a lot of discontentment in public discourse about that 
and some of that is even leveled toward Exxon. So whose fault is it that Guyana continues to find itself in this place where the people are not getting as much value as they can from these extractive industries? So, so that's a, definitely an excellent question. And, and I think I'm going to have to give a few disparate answers and then try to pull them together to, to kind of make sense. So the chamber met with the GYEITI, mm -hmm. I think it's the Guyana Init Extractive Industry Init Transparency Initiative. Yes. And what I realized, with, realized by meeting them was how much we needed to implement more oversight over our extractive sector, right? Now, mm -hmm. let me caveat that with something because as a, as a business person, I would describe myself as a capitalist and I like smaller government. Mm -hmm. So what I, I prefer is not just this massive organization bearing down on everybody wielding tax policy like a sword to, to kind of hit people over the head with, right? What we're talking about is being able to look efficiently at how these industries run, what they're exporting, what the value add is, how much people are employed, how much tax revenue is being collected, and then making decisions. Because for instance, you might find that some industries could be a little bit more efficient in terms of what they return to the country. But sometimes the way to go do that is not to go hit the operators within that in industry over the head and say, well, we're just going to increase the taxes. You know? mm -hmm. Screw you guys. We're just going to double the taxes required you, you need to pay. You, you, gotta, you have to explain to these people because they're smart. You know? People in every industry are more intelligent sometimes than we give them credit for. And they understand the day-to-day -day workings very well from a street point of view. And for every action you take, they'll find an equal and opposite reaction to beat. So you need to tell people why it is they need to increase how much they give back to the country. You need to show them what you're going to do, right? Which is going back to why I say that you cannot have a policy divorce from national planning. You cannot have, and for us, local content as a discussion shouldn't stop at the petroleum sector. Mm -hmm. Local content as a discussion should go past the, the, the petroleum sector. When, when we first met with e EPGL mm -hmm. in the Chamber of Commerce and we started talking about local content, they said, well, you know, fair, we're, we're open to local content, but is it just for the petroleum sector? And they had a point. And I think that, I mean, I'll, I'll be fair to, for, to Kaicho News as a publication. I think they've been fighting for this for, for <laughs> quite a while. You mm -hmm. know, a lot, you could look at a lot of the headlines. And I agree. I mean, that page one comment there says that we as Guyanese can do a lot more than other people give it f us credit for. We survived some hard times as a country and our people are very resilient. So why is it we are saying we can't or we won't or we should be told by somebody else how to? You have a lot of very capable Guyanese business people out there who want to reinvest in their country. And, you know, you got a lot of these guys that came through hard times, you know, and then they kind of grew with the country. And now they want to increase their level of sophistication of doing business. Why is it we can't have Guyanese hotel developers? Has anybody asked or actually reached out to say, hey, you know, let's, let's, let's get... Because the key thing is, as long as you show our people how to do it or you put some amount of, you know, let's say, engineering and consultancy behind them, they'll get it done, you know? Why is it that we can't build these things with Guyanese labor? And I think that we need to sh stop shortchanging ourselves. And similarly, you know, for the extractive industries, why is it we can't get companies who will take our natural resources? And, and I, I mean, this is not particularly at the, the petroleum industry. This is at the other extractives. Mm -hmm. Why is it we can't have 
other companies who will be able to give us a higher return for the natural resource extracted. I think we should turn around and, 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 this, uh, and that's exactly what your, your editorial is doing, is saying, look, when you lift that extractive out, these are non-renewable resources. You're not getting another, and if it's gold, you're not getting another ounce. If it's bauxite, you're not getting another ton. It, it, it doesn't grow naturally like that, right? So what is it we have earned as a result of taking so much tons of bauxite out or so much ounces of gold out? And has what that value is on open market, what percentage of that value on open market have we earned? And how much of that value could we have captured through pushing, you know, let's say local content within that? So maybe companies who are joint venture or partnered to exploit these resources, would they have given us a better return on our investment or, or let's say return on our resource, you know, for extracting it? And that's something that we need to look at going forward. Guyana pre-2015 was a destination where you, know, you had mainly the Russians and the Chinese who were interested in our resources. Guyana post-2015 is a country where the whole world is suddenly interested in our resources. Right. Right. And I think that Guyana post-2015, we need to realize that we have a lot more negotiating power than we think. And if we get better infrastructure and better energy costs, you're going to unlock a lot of potential in the rest of these industries. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that we can become a very big regional power. I mean, we're talking about, you got Jamaica, an economy of about 15, 16 billion, uh, or maybe 18. You got Trinidad in an economy at 20 billion. There's no reason we can't grow in a size to be at similar size or bigger because Trinidad is heavily dependent on oil. Jamaica is heavily dependent on tourism. You imagine a country, you know, where you have 1.5 million Guyanese living outside of Guyana. You have 700,000 Guyanese living in Guyana. I don't see why our population can't get to about 1.3, 1.4 million in country. And you have industries like agriculture, and I, I take out logging outside of agriculture, extractive such as gold, bauxite, and if they find rare earths and other minerals such as mm -hmm. manganese, we can push tourism such as, uh, I think you have, we can have medical tourism with specialty hospitals, we can have business tourism with investment, and we still got eco-tourism. So tourism can fly. Construction for sure, because you can expect an expanded need for residential space, commercial space, and industrial space, and infrastructure build out. When you take those pillars of an economy and look at what we will look like in the future, we should be the regional powerhouse. Not a regional powerhouse, the regional powerhouse. I mean, just let's think of food. I think I remember one of the headlines that stuck out to me is that CARICOM imports somewhere around six billion U.S. dollars in food, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and we sit on eighty-three thousand square miles. Um, you know, a good portion of that is arable land. So the future is very bright for us, but we have to start building capacity. And if how do we build capacity? Well, we've got a local content policy in the petroleum industry, but. Where's the national development plan? Where's the local content in the other industries? And that's what needs to happen because if we want to be this regional powerhouse, we have to have Guyanese companies who can export and do business at an internationally competitive level. And they will be able to, but we just need the right environment to foster them to. Okay. You know, Kaitor News has been very militant in our coverage of <laughs> developments in all of the extractive sectors and in cases where it may seem as though the the country is getting the short end of the stick 
because of this newspaper's reporting on the oil sector, for example, it has taken an official stance, you might have noticed, on the Starbucks license. It has demanded a better deal uh, with a 10% royalty as what this newspaper would say is a fair starting point. What is your, um, your <laughs> stance on the deal? You think that Ghana should demand more? So I think we've seen a, a, a lot of information between the Global Witness Report and then I see, saw a few reports in international media rebutting the Global Witness Report, right? Mm -hmm. And clearly we've seen most of the major parties say that they will not renegotiate the deal. Mm -hmm. My personal feelings uh, are this, because I don't think we ever actually came up with an official position from the chamber. So I'll, I'll speak as myself personally. Sure. I think that... Clearly, the government negotiators let the country down in terms of what they came up with. Mm -hmm. um, I think we possibly could have negotiated a better deal. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate thing that I would say, though, is that because we want to show international investors that we do honor contracts, I wouldn't recommend renegotiating right away because we, you kind of wasted that golden opportunity, at least at that point. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a f basically at least lease a one. Let's look at it. You have a 40 year fee life. I don't think that we're going to just sit down for the next 40 years and say, well, that's the end of the contract for the Starbucks license. I'm sure things are going to be a lot more fluid over a 40 year period. Because uh, let's, let's step back for a second and let's look at it this way. Mm -hmm. What have we signed? We've signed, in essence, signed a lease for an area where there's a resource and the, the leaseholder exploits the resource and gives us a return on investment. Yeah. Right? How many companies in the world, I would love, I would actually love to go out and check this, sign a 40 or 100 year agreement and stick exactly to the 40 or 100 year agreement. I mean, if it were me, I'd can, stick to it if it gave me a huge share. Can, do we even know who is going to be president in the country in 15 years? We don't. <laughs> we don't. So, the, the thing is, what I would say is, let's divide, let's divide the way of answering this question into near term mm -hmm. and further afield. Further afield, I think it depends on what happens. you got geopolitics. you got return on investment. you got... What happens to it? There's a lot of talk in terms of climate change, peak oil, and other stuff. So, you got a lot of things that are fluid in, in that direction. Mm -hmm. Near term, which is at least the next six to eight years, I say definitely we shouldn't go back and renegotiate within that near term period. Mm -hmm. Further afield, well, it depends because we just don't have all, all the answers right away. <laughs> I don't, you know. I'm still trying to figure out the next two years, much less the next four to. And that's, that's the thing. So my summarization on the license is that we missed an opportunity in 2016 where we should have gone for, for better terms. And it's simple. I mean, if, if I were in the position, I would have, knowing that I had no experience in terms of negotiating a contract, I would have hired international negotiators and it creates a nice separation because I'm able to maintain the relationship with the operator, but I have an international law firm or, or consultant negotiating on my behalf. And then I'm able to negotiate with the operator saying, here are the recommendations from my international negotiator. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're friendly. Um, I'm, great to, I'm glad to have you in the country, but these are the recommendations. These are the studies that were done. These are the average benchmarks for royalties in this, in this way. This is the way I would like to carve up our regime. And, you know, yes, I, I, you can say that it's, it's um, a risky frontier area, but here is what is, is, is kind of the, the recommendations from our international guys. And I'm sorry, but these are my hired negotiators. You know, I'm going with their recommendations. And let's start opening the ball from there. Because, I mean, I... I as, as a Guyanese company, as a local Guyanese company, I've had to negotiate with companies that are 10, 20, 30 times my size on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we have to arm ourselves with data 
And sometimes if we have relationships with the companies because we've developed, you know, relationships where you're very close to the, the representatives for your particular company, you insert somebody into the process who is neutral and who you've hired to go out and do the best job for you to negotiate. And you let them go. And then you get to say to, to the person you're negotiating, well, you know, hey, I'm sorry, but these are the guys I hired and this is what they recommended. So this yeah. is what I'm fighting for. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Boyer, for appearing on this week's edition of Petroleum 101. Um, I think we've had a very fruitful, long discussion. And the people are going to read about it in the paper. <laughs> um, so... Do you have any final comments you want to leave with yeah. Guyana before you go? So, I mean, I got to say, that, oh, all right. So I am happy that at least we have this policy because one of the things is I said that I no policy it was always worse than, than a policy that needs some tweaks. So at least now we have a policy. Mm -hmm. But what we need to focus on is not just kind of leaving this policy and kind of letting it go. We need to start work on how we improve this policy as soon as possible because okay. there are definitely some areas that do not align well and so that's why my overall comment in terms of the policy is that i think it is starts with a lot of nice details in terms of the local content plans but needs a lot of input at how it fits in within the overall sector as well it is it needs to be expanded because right now it's only the upstream sector and a certain portion of the upstream sector of the petroleum industry yes so there are a lot of things that we can get to work on and improving quickly okay you're listening to Kaitro radio on 99.1 and 99.5 fm i am your host kimal king and good night <laughs>